KV-62 is the standard Egyptological designation for the tomb of the young pharaoh Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings, now renowned for the wealth of valuable antiquities it contained. The tomb was discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter, underneath the remains of workmen's huts built during the Ramesside period. This explains why it was largely spared from desecration and from the tomb clearances at the end of the 20th dynasty, although the tomb was robbed and resealed twice in the period after its completion. The tomb was densely packed with items in great disarray, partly due to its small size, the two robberies, and the apparently hurried nature of its completion. Due to the state of the tomb, and to Carter's meticulous recording technique, the tomb took eight years to empty, the contents all being transported to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Tutankhamun's tomb had been entered at least twice not long after his mummy was buried, and well before Carter's discovery. The outermost doors of the shrines enclosing the king's nested coffins were unsealed, though the inner two shrines three and four remained intact and sealed. Topic. Discovery of the tomb In 1907, just before his discovery of the tomb of Hormheb, Theodore M. Davis's team uncovered a small site containing funerary artifacts with Tutankhamun's name and some embalming parts. Erroneously assuming that this site, numbered finally as KV-54, was Tutankhamun's complete tomb, Davis concluded the dig. The details of both findings are documented in Davis's 1912 publication, The Tombs of Harmhabi and Tuatankamanu. The book closes with the comment, I fear that the Valley of the Kings is now exhausted. The British Egyptologist Howard Carter employed by Lord Carnarvon hired a crew to help him excavate at the site of KV-62. Carter went back to a line of huts that he had abandoned a few seasons earlier. After the crew cleared the huts and rock debris beneath, their young water boy accidentally stumbled on a stone that turned out to be the top of a flight of steps cut into the bedrock. Carter had the steps partially dug out until the top of a mud-plastered doorway was found. The doorway was stamped with indistinct cartouches oval seals with hieroglyphic writing. Carter ordered the staircase to be refilled, and sent a telegram to Carnarvon, who arrived two and a half weeks later on 23 November along with his 21-year-old daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert. The excavators cleared the stairway completely, which allowed clearer seals lower down on the door to be read, seals bearing the name of Tutankhamun. However, further examination showed that the door blocking had been breached and resealed on at least two occasions. Clearing the blocking led to a downward corridor that was completely blocked with packed limestone chippings, through which a robber's tunnel had been excavated and anciently refilled. At the end of the tunnel was a second sealed door that had been breached and resealed in antiquity. Carter then made a hole in the door and used a candle to check for foul gases, before looking inside. At first I could see nothing. He would later write. The hot air escaping from the chamber causing the candle flame to flicker, but presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist, strange animals, statues, and gold—everywhere the glint of gold." After a pause, Carnarvon asked, "'Can you see anything?' Carter famously replied, "'Yes, wonderful things." Topic. Investigation The first step to the stairs was found on November 4, 1922. The following day saw the exposure of a complete staircase. The end of November saw access to the antechamber and the discovery of the annex, and then the burial chamber and treasury. On November 29, the tomb was opened, and the first announcement and press conference followed the next day. The first item was removed from the tomb on December 27. On February 16, 1923, the burial chamber was opened, and on April 5, Lord Carnarvon died. On February 12, 1924, the granite lid of the sarcophagus was raised. In April, Carter argued with the Antiquities Service and left the excavation for the United States. 
In January 1925, Carter resumed activities in the tomb, and on October 13, he removed the cover of the first sarcophagus. On October 23, he removed the cover of the second sarcophagus. On October 28, the team removed the cover of the final sarcophagus and exposed the mummy, and on November 11, the examination of the remains of Tutankhamun started. Work started in the Treasury on October 24, 1926, and between October 30 and December 15, 1927, the annex was emptied and examined. On November 10, 1930, eight years after the discovery, the last objects were removed from the tomb. <laughs> <laughs> Layout of tomb In design, the tomb appears to have originally been intended for a private individual, not for royalty. There is some evidence to suggest that the tomb was adapted for a royal occupant during its excavation. This may be supported by the fact that only the burial chamber walls were decorated, unlike royal tombs in which nearly all walls were painted with scenes from the Netherworld books. Topic: Staircase Starting from a small, level platform, 16 steps descend to the first doorway, which was sealed and plastered, although it had been penetrated by grave robbers at least twice in antiquity. <laughs> Entrance corridor Beyond the first doorway, a descending corridor leads to the second sealed door, and into the room that Carter described as the antechamber. This was used originally to hold material left over from the funeral and material associated with the embalming of the king. After an initial robbery, this material was either moved into the tomb proper, or to KV-54, and the corridor was sealed with packed limestone chippings which covered some debris from the first robbery. A later robbery broke through the outer door and excavated a tunnel through the chippings to the second door. The robbery was discovered and the second door was resealed, the tunnel refilled, and the outer door sealed again. Some remnants in the corridor appear to have been from a funerary meal matching one discovered by Davis in jars in KV 54, which indicates that KV 54 may have been used as a store for items recovered after the first resealing of the tomb. Carter said that he found the head of Nephitim in this section. Antechamber The undecorated antechamber was found to be in a state of «organized chaos», partly due to ransacking during the robberies, and contained approximately 700 objects articles 14 to 171 in the Carter catalogue amongst which were three funeral beds, one decorated with the heads of lions the goddess Mehet, one with the heads of spotted cattle representing the Great Flood, or Mehet Ure, and one featuring a composite animal with the body of a lion, the tail of a hippopotamus, and the head of a crocodile representing the corpse devourer Amet. Perhaps the most remarkable item in this room were the components, stacked, of four chariots of which one was possibly used for hunting, one for war, and another two for parades. A large chest was found to contain military items, walking sticks, the king's underwear and a copper alloy trumpet, one of two trumpets found in the tomb, the oldest functioning brass instruments in the world. Burial chamber Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Decoration This is the only decorated chamber in the tomb, with scenes from the opening of the mouth ceremony showing I, Tutankhamun's successor acting as the king's son, despite being older than he is and Tutankhamun with the goddess Nut on the north wall, the first hour of Amduat on the west wall, spell one of the Book of the Dead on the east wall and representations of the king with various deities Anubis, Isis, Hathor and others now destroyed on the south wall. The north wall shows Tutankhamun being followed by his car, being welcomed to the underworld by Osiris. Some of the treasures in Tutankhamun's tomb are noted for their apparent departure from traditional depictions of the boy king. 
Certain cartouches where a king's name should appear have been altered, as if to reuse the property of a previous pharaoh has often occurred. However, this instance may simply be the product of updating the artifacts to reflect the shift from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun. Other differences are less easy to explain, such as the older, more angular facial features of the middle coffin and canopic coffinets. The most widely accepted theory for these latter variations is that the items were originally intended for Smenkhkari, who may or may not be the mysterious KV-55 mummy. This mummy, according to craniological examinations, bears a striking first order father to son, brother to brother relationship to Tutankhamun. Topic: <laughs> Contents. The entire chamber was occupied by four gilded wooden shrines which surrounded the king's sarcophagus. The outer shrine measured 5.08 by 3.28 by 2.75 meters and 32 millimeters thick, almost entirely filling the room, with only 60 centimeters at either end and less than 30 centimeters on the sides. Outside of the shrines were 11 paddles for the solar boat, containers for scents, and lamps decorated with images of the god Happy. The fourth and innermost shrine was 2.90 meters long and 1.48 meters wide. The wall decorations depict the king's funeral procession, and Nut was painted on the ceiling, embracing the sarcophagus with her wings. This sarcophagus was constructed in granite. Each corner of the main body and lid were carved from stone of different colors. It appears to have been constructed for another owner, but then recarved for Tutankhamun. The identity of the original owner is not preserved. In each corner, a protective goddess Isis, Nephthys, Circuit, and Neith guards the body. Inside, the king's body was placed within three mummiform coffins, the outer two made of gilded wood, while the innermost was composed of 110.4 kg of pure gold. Tutankhamun's mummy was adorned with a gold mask, mummy bands and other funerary items. The funerary mask is made of gold, inlaid with lapis lazuli, carnelian, quartz, obsidian, turquoise and glass and faience, and weighs 11 kg Funerary <inaudible> <inaudible> text <inaudible> 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 The Enigmatic Book of the Netherworld is a two-part ancient Egyptian funerary text inscribed on the second shrine of the sarcophagus. The term, enigmatic, here refers to it being written in cryptographic code, a New Kingdom practice also known from the tombs of Ramesses IX and Ramesses V. Its content is therefore not readily available to Egyptology. Coleman 2004 interprets it in terms of the creation and rebirth of the sun. The text is broken into three sections that incorporate other funerary texts, such as the Book of the Dead and the Amduat. The text is notable for containing the first known depiction of the Ouroboros symbol, in the form of two serpents interpreted as manifestations of the deity Mehen encircling the head and feet of a god, taken to represent the unified Ra Osiris. Treasury. <inaudible> <inaudible> The treasury was the burial chamber's only side room and was accessible by an unblocked doorway. It contained over 5,000 catalogued objects, most of them funerary and ritual in nature. The two largest objects found in this room were the king's elaborate canopic chest and a large statue of Anubis. Other items included numerous shrines containing gilded statuettes of the king and deities, model boats and two more chariots. This room also held two mummies of fetuses that DNA has shown to have been stillborn offspring of the king. Annex The annex, originally used to store oils, ointments, scents, foods and wine, was the last room to be cleared, from the end of October 1927 to the spring of 1928. Although small in size, it contained approximately 280 groups of objects, totaling more than 2,000 individual pieces. Also found within the annex chamber were 26 jars containing wine residue. Topic: 
Topic: <inaudible> Robberies. During the excavation, it quickly became apparent that the tomb had been robbed in ancient times. The upper part of the door leading into the tomb had been damaged and repaired, with the symbol of the royal necropolis affixed. Behind it was a corridor carved through the bedrock filled with limestone chippings, which seemed to have been tunneled through. A second door had also been penetrated and repaired at some point. Parts of absent objects and traces of oils in empty jars led Carter to conclude that the tomb had been raided for gold shortly after Tutankhamun's burial, and again for expensive oils. The corridor had presumably been filled with debris after the first robbery, as the inner plaster door lacked the marking of the chippings that the repaired area demonstrated, indicating that it had dried before its placement. This debris had been tunneled through in a later robbery. The chippings also covered some fragments of looted articles including jar lids, razors and wood fragments that had been presumably removed from the antechamber and stored in the tunnel during the first robbery, two sealed chambers leading from the antechamber—the annex and the burial chamber—had also been raided. The annex was probably worst affected by the first robbery. The room was small and full of densely packed items, which had been ransacked by a robber who had entered through a small hole in the outer door. The robber hurriedly disturbed the contents of the annex, emptied boxes and removed items. The robbers seemed to have been looking for metals, glass then a valuable commodity, cloth, oils and cosmetics. The robbery was fairly contemporary with the burial, as the lifespan of oils and cosmetics would have been limited. After this robbery was discovered, the doors were resealed and it is likely that the descending tunnel was filled with packed limestone chippings to deter future robberies. The second robbery required much more organization to clear the descending corridor. A tunnel was dug in the top left-hand corner of the tunnel and the outer door was penetrated by a large hole in the blocking. Carter estimated that it would have taken a team of men around 8 hours to excavate the tunnel by passing back baskets of rubble. The second robbery penetrated the entire tomb, and Carter estimated that around 60% of the jewelry in the treasury had been looted, along with precious metals. At some point, a knotted scarf containing a number of looted rings was dropped back into a box in the antechamber, which led Carter to the conclusion that the robbery had perhaps been discovered while it was in progress, or that the thieves had been pursued and caught. The tomb may have been hurriedly resealed, possibly to avoid drawing attention to the tomb by the official Maya, as the signature of his assistant Jehutamos was found by Carter on a calcite stand in the annex. Upon resealing the tomb, the first and second resealings were marked with the same seal, bearing a design of a jackal over nine bound captives, which may indicate that they both took place within a short time interval after the closure of the tomb. <laughs> Possible undiscovered chambers Research by prominent Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves attached to the University of Arizona suggested, in 2015, that there may be areas of the tomb worthy of further analysis. Reeves investigated high-resolution digital scans of the tomb taken by Madrid-based company Factum Art that were used in the process of creating a facsimile of the tomb. Reeves noted markings in the plaster of the burial chamber that appeared to suggest the possibility of a small door in the west wall of the burial chamber, of the same dimensions as the annex door. According to Reeves, markings on the north wall could also suggest that the wall itself may partly be a blocking wall covering a void, possibly indicating that the antechamber continues as a corridor beyond the north wall. Although the doors may just be uncompleted construction work. One possibility that has been suggested is that Tutankhamun is actually buried in the outer section of a larger tomb complex similar to the tomb of Amenhotep III that has been sealed off by the north wall, and that a further burial possibly that of Nefertiti may exist elsewhere in undiscovered areas of the tomb. In March 2016, a ground-penetrating radar scan revealed two empty spaces and what appear to be organic and metallic materials within them. However, researchers from the University of Turin used sonar to evaluate the tomb and found no evidence of any yet unrevealed chambers, disproving this hypothesis. The Egyptian Ministry of State of Antiquities reviewed and accepted these results, which were presented in May 2018.
Topic: <laughs> Meteorite Dagger. A 2016 study suggested that the dagger buried with Tutankhamun was made from an iron meteorite, with similar proportions of metals iron, nickel and cobalt to one discovered near and named after Carga Oasis. <laughs> Present day The tomb is open to the public at an additional charge to that of general admission to the Valley of the Kings. The number of visitors was limited to 400 per day in 2008. The tomb was closed beginning in 2010 while restoration work was undertaken by the Getty Conservation Institute. A replica of the tomb begun in 2009 was opened about a mile from the original in 2014. The Getty Conservation Institute completed its renovation in early 2019, marking the most significant restoration of the tomb to date. It is expected to continue accepting visitors. See also Anubis Shrine Lotus Chalice Tutankhamun's Mummy Tutankhamun's Trumpets Curse of the Pharaohs Of Time, Tombs and Treasures, a 1977 documentary film about the discovery of KV-62